I see that hand. Isn't that what the old preachers say? Invitation time when no one raises their hand. I see that hand. That's true, unfortunately. Uh, now, most of our invitations, we sing the song and we get done. And uh, But, you know, there was the old practice of uh, having air, everybody, clo everybody bow your head and close your eyes and, and then ex an explanation of the gospel, which is necessary and good. And then uh, if you prayed that prayer with me, raise your hand. And even, you're not supposed to peek, but I've peeked before. And, uh, and uh, occasionally you'll have that preacher who wants to psychologically warm people up to the idea of making the profession of Christ and, and says, I see that hand when there's no hand. That's a little dishonest to me. That's a little dishonest to me. Uh, we, uh, my wife and I found a movie to watch the other night. We don't usually stay up much later than the girls do. Uh, but uh, we decided to stay up and watch a movie. It was called Church People. I think we're going to show it here because it's about a big mega church that became all about the show instead of the gospel. Now, I've had to get over that attitude to some degree because I've learned that when it comes to big church pastors and, and others, there's a lot I could learn about organization, and, and many of them are very, very much about the gospel, and they do their job really well, and that's why, that's why their churches have grown so much. But I want to show it here just to remind everybody that as we go through this revitalization process, when we talk about doing fun things at church to bring the people in, we got to remember church cannot be about those things. And so we'll have a youth fundraiser, and the youth will make taco salad or something, something like that, right, Josh? And uh, and we'll uh, and we'll you know you can donate money. Speaking of donating money, here comes some more announcements. Uh, Hope of Lake Lafayette, the church plant that is happening up the road at Lake Lafayette, uh, they have property to build on. They were interested in uh, buying a modular building just to get started with from Iowa. The Lord intervened and they found three of the same kind of building locally, pardon me, locally for not much more money. So I don't know if I'm allowed to tell all the details and stuff, but... Uh, it still sounds like a lot of money to me, but at some point maybe we will help them try to raise that money and they can get brilliant, you know, the, the foundations can be poured and the modular pieces can be brought and they can begin to serve people because uh, over at Standing in the Gap, they have a food pantry. Half that food pantry goes with Hope of Lake Lafayette over to feed people there at Lake Lafayette. And it's hard. Uh, they have services some people show up, but they want to really reach the community, the people that are there that need the help. And, of course, those people, they don't want to walk in the doors of the church. We, in our assessment committee, have been talking about, you know, uh, tip, you know we're, doing, we're going to be doing all these things to make our building more presentable, and we're going to be doing these things to, to make our church more presentable. But most people are not out looking for a church. We've got to go out and get them. Amen. We've got to go out and get them. Them. So we're always happy to have a visitor, but we need to take our responsibility sharing Jesus with people. And let's segue into the sermon now, and what a Jesus we have to share with people. Amen? Amen. That's right. And so well, that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. And for about three or four chapters, we are going to be talking about how Jesus is a better high priest than anything we could have ever had under the Old Testament. And I thought, well, what am I supposed to do? If this is one subject, am I supposed to preach a sermon over three or four chapters of the Bible? Do I just pick out little verses out of it, trying not to preach for two to three hours, trying not to put everybody to sleep with all the details from the Old Testament? But I got news for you. It's not just the first century Jews who grew up going to the temple and doing sacrifices and trying to keep the law. It's not just them who want to abandon Jesus for other things. And we may not be Jews who think that our salvation can be found in making sacrifices at the temple, but I tell you what, we can be Americans who think that if I just made more money, then I would be happy. If we would just move into this neighborhood then I would be more happy. If only this would come together for me in my life, then I would finally be 
fulfilled and content. If only I could retire with this much money. If only I had this other job that I liked so much. I got news for you. God created you to find your contentment and your fulfillment in Him. And everything else that you try, I'm not even... I, I know my mode is just to preach down to you and tell you it's wrong. But I, I shouldn't even tell you it's wrong. I should just give you the fair warning that it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Bad things like drugs, alcohol, nicotine... Caffeine, we'll put myself in there too. Caffeine uh, brings enjoyment. Some of it for a long time, some of it for a little time. But if that's what you put your faith and trust in, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. It's going to lead to disappointment. Money, friends, fame. One day it's going to be just you before God. The creator that made you. And you're going to learn that your whole life should have been about God. And that's easy for a preacher to say. It's his job for his life to be about God, right? No, it's my job to tell you that your life needs to be about God. He didn't make you for any other purpose. And sure, you can be about God and be a fire chief. You can be about God and be a farmer. You can be all about God and be a father, a wife, a husband, uh, a mother. You can do all of those things to the glory of God. But you've got to put God. You've got to put Jesus first. Because we're not just talking about some nebulous God who lives in the sky. We are talking about the man Jesus. If you want to turn in Genesis in your Bibles to chapter 14, we are going to read part of one of the most fascinating stories in the Old Testament. Abraham lives in the promised land. His, children, his descendants are not going to inherit it for several hundred more years. He and his nephew Lot, they got to where they had so many sheep and cattle that they were fighting over water resources, fighting over pasture land. Not Abraham and Lot as nephew, but the people that worked for them were fighting him. So they split up and they go their separate ways. Uh, uh, Lot seems to abandon sheep herding altogether and moves into a city called Sodom. That becomes famous later on in the Bible for being destroyed by God. And, uh, but before that happens, we have this very interesting story because we always think of Abraham as this boring guy, you know, and, and, and what he is to most of us is he's the answer to the trivia question. Who is the father of the Hebrew race? And the answer is Abraham. We don't think he did much else. There's a whole bunch of chapters in Genesis about him. But, uh, in fact, he is one of the most important people in the Bible. But just when you think he's this boring old shepherd, and, and he's 75 by the time we meet him, so we don't think he's capable of a whole lot. But no offense to anybody. But, but you know, it's like, okay, old guy, white hair, white beard, lots of robes, something about circumcision. And then political upheaval there in the Jordan Valley catches his attention. There, were, there was a coalition of kings and another coalition of kings, and one of the coalitions of kings was dominating the other one, making them pay tribute, threatening to invade if they didn't get their payments. And finally, that subjected coalition decided to gather an army and revolt. And in the ensuing chaos, an army came to the city of, of Sodom and Gomorrah, which probably wouldn't have bothered Abraham at all except that his nephew Lot lives in the city of Sodom. And one of the many people they capture and carry off is Lot and his family and all of their possessions. And this is the story where we learn that Abraham, boring old white-haired Abraham, hanging out with sheep in the desert, grabs his 300 well-trained in battle servants and they go and they defeat this coalition <laughs> army and bring back not just his nephew Lot and all of his possessions, but everything that those people had stolen. So we're not going to read the whole story. I summed up the battle part for you. And, uh, and back then, just like today, there were rules about the spoils of war. Abraham could have kept everything. He wasn't the one that originally stole it. He went and stole it back from the people who stole it in the first place. 
He could have at least kept a big part of it, but he didn't do that either. He wanted his nephew Lot to go on with life with all of his possessions. He had a bunch of men with him, so they, prob they killed a few sheep and ate them, or they found bread amongst it, and they had to have a meal. They'd been working on this. They were entitled to it, so he, uh, uh, he took that portion out, but he didn't want to keep all this for himself. But he did tithe on it. In, uh, in chapter 14, starting in verse 13, we are going to read everything the Bible has to say about Melchizedek. It's tiny. In chapter 14, we read, starting in verse 30, 13, Then one who had escaped... Oh, I'm sorry. I said that wrong. Let's skip down to uh, verse 17. After his return from the defeat of Kedileomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten, the share of the men who went with me. Let Anner, Eshcol, and Mamre take their share. And those were some of the men who fought alongside him, and that is all. But, and if you're wondering who is Melchizedek, that's the point. He comes out of nowhere. We don't get his genealogy. He's the king of Salem, which we think was the predecessor city to Jerusalem. Some people disagree. And why would Abraham, progenitor of the race of God's people, why would he be paying tithes and offerings to this guy? Why is he so important? Well, we're going to get into that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've given us. Lord, we thank you even for the mysterious people of the Bible that we don't know much about. I pray that we would learn from them what it is that we are supposed to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, in Hebrews chapter 7, we read, chapter 7, verse 1, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, and to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God. He continues as a priest forever. Number one on your little sheet, even Abraham... Owed, and that first blank is tithes, to a priest of the Most High God. And that is how God is titled in this story. And apparently, uh, Abraham would not be paying tithes to this guy if it wasn't, if it was some other God than the Lord God who made heaven and earth that had called out Abraham from among the nations. And so... I want you to get this because we're not going to get this as modern day Americans, but Abraham was the most important person to the Jewish people. Abraham was the one that was not foolish enough to be dancing around a fire and sacrificing children to some pagan god. Everyone else would carve a god out of wood or stone and then bow down to it, even though you knew exactly where it came from. And yet God had called out Abraham and that made Abraham special and that made the Jewish people special and God had revealed himself to Abraham and yet you have this really strange story. Who is this Melchizedek person? In fact, King David picked up on this and the psalm that is heavily quoted here in Hebrews and like I said, we could talk a lot about this. Just like he said in last week's sermon, about this we have much to say, the author of Hebrews said. About this we have much to say. And so, bear with me the next couple of weeks. Next Sunday's sermon is, uh, covers about two chapters, just the highlights. Don't worry, just what we're supposed to get out of it. And you can read the whole thing on your own time. But 
The point is, is that, and, and there, whatever it is that you think is so perfect and wonderful in your life, it pales in comparison to Jesus. It really does. It really absolutely does. There is nothing in your life more important. Now, here at church, we want your marriage to be good and strong. And we've probably not been giving you the resources that you might need. Organizing trips to marriage retreats for whoever wants to go, um, offering classes, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. We've only got so many volunteers around here, so that's part of the reason, but we can't let it be an excuse. We want to show you that we care about your marriage. But is it the most important thing with your life? Is your relationship with your spouse the most important thing in your life? Well, according to the Bible, God needs to come first. You know, our culture values raising children. It also values doing a terrible job at it, but that's a different sermon. But our, our, in our culture, if you say something is to protect children, unless, of course, they're not born yet, if you say it's to protect children, you can get everyone to vote about what, vote in favor of whatever it is that you are putting out there. And, and we don't call them housewives anymore. What do we call them if they're at home and don't work outside the home? We call them stay-at-home moms. The language has shifted from her primary job being a wife to no her primary job is to take care of the kids if she's a stay-at-home mom and if she doesn't work outside. It's, it's a very subtle change in nature. In fact, everyone is in sports because we are all convinced that if we don't get our children into sports, they will go out and do drugs because they're just so ever-loving, bored all the time and they have nothing to do. And so we must get them into something that trains them about good character. And I love all of that, man. Sports teaches you character. Sports teaches you that you can give 110% because what you thought was 100% of effort, turns out it wasn't. You can go farther. So sports teaches a lot of good things, but it doesn't teach everything. And sometimes we are so concerned about hurting our children's feelings because they are the most important thing in our life, but God says they are not supposed to be the most important thing in your life. God is supposed to be the most important thing of your life. And then when you get that right, you can orient your spouse over the children because your spouse came along first and God instituted marriage himself and so that your children can see what a strong marriage looks like and your children can see what happened, that, that, that they don't rule the world anymore, that mom and dad have a united front and your children can learn that even what mom and dad want has to be subjected subjected to God and what God wants. We have all kinds of things in our society fighting for that preeminent place in our lives and we must give it to Jesus. Why? Because he is the king. David foretold that he would, and, uh, and if we go a little light on reading in Hebrews today, feel free to read it on your own time, but I am looking at the clock, and so we're just going to run through chapter 7, okay? Get your running shoes on. Here we go. Run through chapter 7 and all of the theology there. Why? Because Jesus is king. If you might recall that one time they were coming to Jesus with questions about, uh, uh, well, tr questions trying to trip him up, and he said, all right, I'm going to ask you one. If the son of David is coming and he's the Messiah and he's the son of David, why does David call him Lord? I mean, the, the, the father does not call the son Lord. But David apparently was talking about someone who would come of his own line, but he's not subjected to David. He is over King David. And in that very same psalm, it gets quoted a lot here. So David calls him Lord, and he also speaks of him of a priest. The priests were not related to David. David was from the tribe of Judah. And if you might recall... The tribe that produced the priests, the only people allowed to go into the temple to make the sacrifice, to serve as priests, were from the tribe of Levi, same tribe as Moses and Aaron. And if you didn't know that, now you know. So, 
trying to give you enough background to understand today. And what does a priest do? A priest is in charge of your relationship with God. In the Old Testament, they made the sacrifices, they made the offerings. When you wanted to thank God, you brought a, a, a free will offering, a gift offering to God. When you had done something wrong, you brought an animal to the priest. The priest made sure it got sacrificed in the right way, gave you, made sure you followed all the instructions. That priest was in charge of your relationship with God. And then along comes Jesus, the son of David, the best king that we've ever known. Who's excited about the fact that there will be no elections in heaven? <laughs> amen, amen. No elections, benevolent dictator, ruling, making all the hard decisions. Jesus is our king. And you need to submit your life to Jesus. I know that Jesus died for your sins and your sins are paid for and now you're saved, but... The Bible also speaks of loving Jesus. All of us who love Jesus, we're going to go see Jesus. And we need to obey Jesus. And we need to obey Jesus by loving one another. And so there's so much more to it than just saying a prayer one day. In fact, I would love to address that right now. Not only do we want you to repent of your sins and say a prayer and believe in Jesus, but we want Jesus to enter your life. And we want Jesus to take over your life. And we want Jesus to live through you. And if you come to church and you look around, and it's like, man, I don't know if I get along with all these people. Well, the only way we're going to get along is if Jesus is at work in our lives. Amen? Amen? Amen. And so you get groups of people together. And sometimes you have a movement. But then whatever the movement was centered around kind of Peter's off or whatever, our movement needs to be about Jesus. And we need to be letting Jesus work on us work on us and change us and I don't I'm not trying to tell you that you need to try harder and do better it's actually very different in the Christian life you don't try harder and do better you surrender you surrender to Jesus we have selfish desires in our life we need to take that to Jesus and we need to surrender Number two on your sheet, Psalm 110 speaks of a descendant of David, but David calls him Lord. Even though he is of David's line, he is a priest. And so both David and the author of Hebrews hundreds of years later have seized on this person, Melchizedek, that just shows up. We read the entire Old Testament story about him in just those few verses there in Genesis. That's the only place he appears, except where David writes about him in a psalm, and here in Hebrews where... The writer of Hebrews can't shut up about him. And it's like, you're writing more about Melchizedek than we knew originally. But I'm here to tell you today, the point is not Melchizedek. The point is Jesus. The translation of Melchizedek's name makes him the king of righteousness. Number three, like Melchizedek, Jesus is the king of righteousness. And then he was also king of a city named Salem, very similar to the Hebrew shalom, which means peace. And so that's your second blank there. And number three, he rules as king and serves as priest of the Most High God. Jesus needs to be Lord of your life. And we need to understand that it is only through Jesus that we can have the fulfillment and the contentment in our lives because we have a relationship with God. All that fulfillment and contentment I was talking about a minute ago that only comes through your relationship with God, that is all Jesus. Jesus is the only priest. If you read chapter 7 of Hebrews, you will see that the Old Testament priesthood set up by God himself, it wasn't a bad thing, but it wasn't complete. And what we're going to see over and over again in Hebrews is that human sinful priests had to first purify themselves through some kind of ritual and then they could go before God and they could offer an offering to purify all the people. And especially when you think of the Day of Atonement, uh, Yom Kippur, they had to come next year and do it all again. And if you did something bad at home, you had to bring an animal and imagine if you lived up in the mountains of Ephraim, you had to come down to Shiloh or Jerusalem or wherever the tabernacle was and where the temple was, and you, had to, you were to bring it all the way down and say, I screwed up, man, I did something really bad. Let's, let's slaughter this animal, and that imperfect priest would help you slaughter that animal and do the right rituals and everything. And now we have Jesus. In Roman times... 
Christianity was very strange. Judaism was already very strange. You have one God? But what about all the chaos in the world? I mean, isn't there another God fighting with your God that, no, we have one God. There's, there's other beings that fight with him, but they're nowhere near as powerful as him. Well, then why isn't everything cakes and rainbows? Good grief, you got one totally good God that's in charge of everything and we still have problems? Believe it or not, this is the same question humanity is asking today. And then comes along Christianity. And whether you're talking about Old Testament religion or pagan religion, it didn't matter. You had a God, you had an image, an idol of some kind, you had an altar, you had an animal you sacrificed on it, you had dances you were supposed to do, and then along come Christians, and what are they doing? Well, they're meeting by a river or something, and they talk for a while, and they bow their heads, and then they go home. What? There was a rumor in Roman times that Christians were secretly atheists because they weren't, they weren't sacrificing anything on any kind of altar. And then there was also a rumor that we were cannibals because someone tried to explain the Lord's Supper. <laughs> this is his flesh and his blood. It smells like bread to me, but you got me worried now. Do we sacrifice in the Christian religion? Yes. It's just that it happened once. 2,000 years ago, and it's still good. We do have sacrifice in the Christian religion. Jesus himself was willing to come and be sacrificed. Do you have a temple? Well, we get into that next week. But the temple in Jerusalem that Solomon built, that was inlaid with gold on the inside everywhere, nothing compared to the real thing in heaven. Sacrifices that don't expire. One sacrifice that's never going to expire. One priest who is so perfect, and yet he is human enough that he can identify with our weaknesses. We got it made in the shade, y'all. We just love our Jesus. I hope you noticed the t-shirt. That's what it says, loving my Jesus on the back. Where are we on your thing? He has no beginning. Uh, the last two of number three are he has no beginning nor end. And in the story of Melchizedek, he comes from out of nowhere and he disappears to wherever off he goes and it's kind of like that. And David jumps on it and says, see right there's a priest of the Most High God. Doesn't have to be a descendant of Levi doesn't have to be a descendant of Aaron, Moses' brother. He comes from nowhere. You, you can't box God in. Number four, Jesus' ministry is superior because he can sin, he can serve, sorry. He can serve continually. Continually. He does not have to first atone for his own sin. He is appointed by God himself, as you can see in verses 22 through 28. Verse 22 is very interesting. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. A better covenant. What has God promised us? God has promised that he will never leave nor forsake us. God has promised that our sins really are forgiven. Sometimes when, well, all the time, and this, this is the conflict that the world has with God, we all feel singled out by the universe for bad things to happen to us. It doesn't matter if it's daily frustrating things like a flat tire or... Um, various things that we would consider smaller. It doesn't matter if you have, uh, like my sister-in-law, a child born with a crazy illness no one's ever heard of. 
from big to small things that happen to us, we are convinced that God or the universe has singled us out for suffering. This is, this is, the, human, this is the human condition. And God has promised us that He has not. Now, there are times when God wants to get our attention. But many times, He doesn't even have to intervene. Just let all the bad things that were going to happen to us anyways in a broken and fallen world happen to us. And maybe we'll get to a point at some point where we finally cry out to Him. We were angry at Him before. We're sick of Him messing with us. But finally, we get desperate enough that <laughs> we know He's the only one that can help. And He wants to help. It wasn't him doing all that stuff to us before. It was us blaming him. But he'll use it. He'll use it to get our attention. Is it, is it better to suffer? Is it better to have a good life and go to hell? Or is it better to suffer? And for that suffering to push you towards God. And you come to God. And then you spend eternity with him. Suffering has a purpose, although in a broken and fallen world, most suffering really is pointless. It really is. But the devil wants you to take your suffering and blame God. Turn away from God. Reject God. The challenge is to be submissive to God. That if God has allowed this to happen, He must know what He's doing. And to not reject God, not turn away from God, but to trust in God. And another word for trust is faith. And we talk about faith all the time at church, but I'm not sure we really know what we're talking about. You can feel bad that bad things are happening for you. I'm angry when bad things happen to me. So as your imperfect human representative, I plan to give you as much grace as I would like myself. But don't stay in that state. Don't let it lead to bitterness and rejection of God. Don't let the feeling that God has abandoned you push you in the direction of abandoning Jesus and his mission and everything. What the devil intends for evil, I pray that God would use for good in your life, that the hard times would push you in the direction of the Savior, that you would lean on him, and that you, surprisingly enough, would discover the depths of love that God has for you, even in your suffering, that you would have not had a clue of without your suffering. Jesus is a better sacrifice, and he mediates it as a better priest, as the guarantor of a better covenant. And you can't do any better than that. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to have our instrumentalists come forward. We're going to sing an invitation song. And the invitation that we are extending to you is to turn your life over to Jesus. And if you have not repented of your sin, repented of what we all live in until we turn to Jesus, what we were born into. I just pray that you would turn that over to God. Maybe you have something in your life that you're struggling with. Maybe you feel like God is far away. We invite you to come forward and ask God to reveal Himself to you, that He is not far away, that He is near, that He has heard your cry, He sees what you're going through, and that He still loves you. And if you want to talk about any of these things, I am available until 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, 7.45, when we are leaving for camp. After that, you may call a deacon. We have very good deacons here who know the Lord very well, and they can be relied upon.